Legislature is back from recess. Um, Senator Morrison, I understand that you closed, but it wasn't sent down, and now I understand that Senator Nelson wishes to speak. So, I, Senator Nelson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a point of information. I don't, um, from my understanding, there was an amendment made where now we're amending the bill to remove sections, uh, I believe, three, four, and five. So, there, was it a closing argument or was it an, an amendment to the bill? Amendment to the bill. Thank you. So, I just wanted to inquire. Um, I, I truly support the intent of the bill. Um, However, uh, there was amendment made prior to that on Section 4 that uh, I don't know what village is from, but so I'll just say your name, Senator Uggen made. And so uh, I was hoping that perhaps we can consider adding that amendment in. Onto the bill. The lockbox. Also, all we have is section one. What sec? I just just for clarification, what sections were amended, were removed? Two, three, four, and I see. Okay. Too easy. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Um, with that, I understand that the, you made the motion to send it down. There being no objection. Next bill on the agenda is Bill 123, Senator, Senator Castro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to move to place Bill 123-34-COR in the third reading file, and I'd like to discuss it. Without objection, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, before I uh, talk briefly about the intent of the bill, I'd like to make two amendments. Please. The first amendment is on page two, and it's to strike lines 23 to 25. So strike lines 23, 24, 25. <clears throat> the second amendment is also on page two, and it's to change uh, page two on line 27 to change B as in Bravo to R as in ready. Okay, let's take the let's take them seriatim. What the first amendment was to strike which? Yes, sir. The force, uh, first amendment is to strike lines 23 and 25 on page two, 23 through 25. So 23, 24, 25. The reason for that, Mr. Speaker, is the reference there uh, is in regards to the 25 states that have reciprocity agreements, and not necessarily 25 states that have reciprocity agreements with Guam. So okay. I, I Any objection to striking those three lines? Any objection to striking those three lines? Anyone wish to be recognized on it? No. Your second amendment, Senator? Second amendment, Mr. Speaker, is also on page two. That is line 27, and it reads section 3101, open parens, B as in Bravo, close parens. I want to change the B to an R, from Bravo to ready. Got that? Change the B to an R. Minor technical amendment. So it's going to be section 3101R, as in regime? Yes. That would be appropriate, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> All right. <laughs> May I proceed? Please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bill 123 34 is an act to extend non commercial driver's license reciprocity to residents of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands who are United States citizens and who are issued such a license by his or her island in the Sinai by adding a new section to Title 16 of the Guam Code annotated Section 3101 license requirement. 
Mr. Speaker, we can certainly acknowledge that the people of the Marianas over the millennia have had a common ancestry, heritage, culture, language, history, and open, as well as a collaborative relationship and stewardship over the use of our natural resources. The passage of this bill into law, at least it's my hope that we can express our desire through this policy piece that we want to continue to work in unison with the CNMI in establishing programs and agreements and extending certain privileges in the areas of public policy that mutually benefit Guam and the CNMI and that are in conformance with the laws of the United States. It's also my hope that by extending this reciprocity agreement, Mr. Speaker, to residents of the CNMI who are U.S. citizens and who have held a license for no less than a year, they may exchange their driver's license for a Guam driver's license so that students, persons conducting business on Guam, members of the armed services residing in the CNMI, or those traveling to Guam for medical purposes, or who even come here to recreate, or who shop, or whose extended activities past 30 days may benefit from it. Further, by passing such an agreement, it communicates that wherever applicable, permissible, and mutually beneficial, the people of the Marianas continue to work towards strengthening our political and cultural solidarity, our desire to prosper together commercially, as well as to seek ways in which we may advance one another's overall state of education, health, and public safety. Mr. Speaker, members of the 34th Guam Legislature, this bill is as important for members of the CNMI, the residents of the CNMI, and this is evident in the fact that they introduced mirror legislation to extend the reciprocation to such an extent that Guam driver's license holders may use their driver's license without expiration in the CNMI, without the need to exchange or surrender their Guam license. This is something that goes above and beyond what our local authorities here were willing to do. So I do thank my colleagues in the CNMI for taking that extra step forward to extend the same, if not greater, privilege to us. But moving away from the technicalities of the bill, Mr. Speaker, in my mind, the bill is less about those questions of whether or not we're going to exchange licenses. It's less about the question of, are you mature enough to operate a personal vehicle on Guam? No, in my mind, the bill is about bri building that bridge between our two islands in order that we may lift up our great Chamorro nation and everyone else who chooses the Marianas as their home. This bill is not about what we're doing with other people in other states, but the bill is about what we're doing for ourselves right here in the Marianas. And for others who share a similar perspective beyond this bill, the measure is also about working on a system that removes unnecessary and artificial barriers between our two islands. I had the privilege to have this conversation with members of the Guam Legislature and the administration, and concerns were raised in working sessions and in sidebars, and I'm prepared to address them with my findings of fact, or where a reference may not be readily available with my perspective as an islander, having been raised on Guam, as well as having lived in the CNMI, in Boston and Manhattan proper, in order that we can make an informed decision, and one that is consistent with the spirit of Nenafat Maulik Zen Inadzudu. The record does reflect that I've had a series of meetings, not one, but several, involving officials from Guam and the CNMI, in hopes that on this specific day, I could stand before you with the privilege to share that both Governor Calvo and Governor Torres and their administration support the intent of Guam Bill 123-34, as well as the CNMI Bill 20, a mirrored piece introduced by the House of Representatives by my brother, the Honorable Ivan A. Blanco. Mr. Speaker, at its very basic element, we're talking about an operator's license. But for others, it's one step closer to strengthening our political and cultural solidarity. If I may, on this bill, let us stand with them with one voice on promoting positive policy so as to serve as an example to everyone and anyone watching today, tomorrow, or in the years to come, that we are in fact capable of building ourselves up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Um, on the main motion, Senator Adda. Any other Senator after Senator Adda wish to speak on this?
Senator Adit, then Senator Ogden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, we already, uh, our, our, our driver's license laws on Guam uh, already allows, for example, um, visitors from the CNMI, other territories, from the United States, from Palau, and the other islands around the region to be able to drive on our highways uh, for a period of up to 30 days using their own driver's license. Um, our law also does uh, allow that if that individual is going to be staying longer than uh, 30 days, uh, that they, um, they can continue to use their driver's license for and extend that up to a year, uh, provided that they register that you know, I'm going to be here for another six months, so the 30 days is just not going to be sufficient. Our law further allows that um, after that year, uh, the individual uh, shall be given, uh, or maybe, I forget exactly how it reads, uh, oh, however, upon the expiration of 30 days, uh, such person shall be exempted from taking the written driver's license examination. So there's, there's certainly a lot of uh, facilitation in our law to accommodate uh, the off-island drivers. Now, what I'm concerned about is um, we have gone to great lengths to ensure that the safety on our highways um, in fact, is is that our highways, that our motorists operate in a in a in a very safe manner out there. So as a result, there's the graduated driver's license for your first time licenses. Your 16 year olds, 17 year olds, uh, they have to go through driver training and all that. Um, the uh, that's that's one step that measure that we've taken to ensure that our drivers out there on Guam's highways uh, are in fact able to operate uh, in a safe uh, manner. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm not certain what the requirements are uh, in these other places, uh, and in particular in the CNMI, uh, to, to make it that, you know, that individual from the CNMI can just come here and and exchange his driver's license for a Guam driver's license. Um, but I guess we can nitpick at all these things. But the one thing that concerns me the most is Department of Revenue and Taxation, the licensing division, did not provide any testimony. Uh, I could probably understand that they didn't come down here and provide oral testimony, but there's no testimony from the very agency. And this is not the first time that, that this effort has been made to try and get this reciprocity. So I'm very curious as to um, why Revan Tax did not show up. And so maybe if the author could yield, has there been any dialogue with Revan Tax um, about this particular bill? Because there's nothing in other than some comments made in the um, fiscal note. Um, other than that, which I don't know if that came from Revan Tax or if that was from from BBMR. Uh, there's there's nothing from the licensing agency. So if the author would yield and maybe enlighten us if there's been any dialogue with Revan Tax. Senator Castro, you yield. Thank you, Senator. Those are indeed uh, good questions. All three points were noted. Uh, the Senator is correct in that there is a provision within the statute to allow for the use of your current U.S. issued license. Actually, it even extends to certain former, uh, foreign domiciliaries, such as the People's Republic of China, Taiwan, even the European Union. Same applies to U.S. territories and the Commonwealth. Uh, the Senator is also correct in that the department has the discretion to extend 
use of the same license up to a year. But it's exactly, that's exactly the reason that I introduced profit this measure, as I was explaining to my colleague, that it's the selective and or discretionary application of one or more or of one or more of those uh, provisions within the statute, Mr. Speaker. I'll give you an example. If you refer to the same statute, 16 GCA Chapter 3, you may be exempted from the written and or demonstrative test component, but they require you, for example, to provide a five-year proof of driving record in good standing, for example, in this case, the CNMI, in writing. Now, that particular requirement was selectively applied to other persons personally known to me in order that they can get their license exchanged. Like my point would be, Senator Ad is absolutely correct in the 30-day provision. It extends to anyone holding a license in any of the foreign countries uh, stated in the statute. I do want to speak to the second point about the graduated driver's license requirement. Several of my sources, which I'll be happy to share, uh, clearly outline the intent of the GDL, which was designed, it's a legal, it's, it's an attempt, it's a legal attempt, a legal policy remedy to a national phenomenon that's attributed to persons of a certain age who have a disproportionate amount of traffic fatalities. I'm not disputing the intent of the GDL. It was targeted specifically for 16 to 17 year olds. As a matter of fact, if you take on the second point of the Senator's inquiry about the safety of motorists, and I think that that's where I'm going with this, I, Mr. I Speaker. I think his, his one inquiry was, in your discussions with, you said you had more than one discussion Yes, with, sir, I had three working sessions. Uh, and so he's asking why there was no comment by the Department of Revenue and Taxation that can be found in the committee report. And if you have those discussions, what what did revenue and taxation state was sure. their position? So to the first question, why hasn't the administration submitted testimony? I, I don't know, but I'll follow up. Uh, to the second question, did I have meetings with the administration? Uh, this would be my third time for the record stating unequivocally I've had three, if not four meetings, uh, one with the director, two no, three with the deputy director herself. The only concern that was raised by the Department of Revenue Taxation was the application of the real ID. And I do concede there is no way around the requirements for the real ID, which there's three or four requirements above and beyond what's required for a driver's license. So this particular measure does not exempt uh, those persons who are wanting to exchange their CNMI driver's license for a Guam driver's license. They could do that within what's provided in the law, but they also have to provide something as an example, uh, a mayor's verification or the equivalent of a U.S. passport, and there's a third provision, sir. Senator, Adder, does that answer your question? I well, so, so I understand then that there has been four meetings, one with a director, three with a deputy director, I guess none with a supervisor or the superintendent of the driver's licensing division. And, and uh, I certainly would be curious, I mean, I'm, I, I would think that those, that those discussions were significant enough that they should have been included in the committee report. I'm just very concerned that, that you know, the agency that is tasked with the licensing of our drivers to keep our highways safe, that there is nothing in the committee report the only thing in the committee report that we have that comes close to that is in the fiscal note from the Bureau of Budget and Management. And their comment is that based on information received, not from revenue, but, ba but they're basically regurgitating what, what they received, the potential fiscal impact of the passage of this bill may result in a decrease of revenues collected for the issuance of learner's permits and intermediate licenses. Um, it presents a loophole for the mandated graduated license process for all first-time applicants. Guam residents may find it more economical and convenient to fly to the CNMI 
and obtain a full license to evade Guam's licensing requirements. For example, driver's education requirements of 40 hours and graduated license process, uh, e.g. Permit, permit stage of two years and intermediate license of three years. The actual number of Guam residents that may resort to this, to this is undetermined at this time. However, in order to illustrate the potential impact, the revenue generated by these types of licenses for FY 2016 are as follows. Instruction permit, $2,000. Learner's permit, $37,000. Intermediate license, $31,000. Now, they didn't come out and say they don't support it, but they're just pointing out what are the implications of Bill 123. But my main concern is there's nothing in the committee report signed by the Director of Revenue and Tax that says we support or we do not support. Here's our concerns. Here's how we can rectify it. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Snickles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I heard the, um, the prime sponsor of the, um, of the bill reference the Real ID Act, and I wanted to kind of just follow that up with, uh, with some questions. I know we're implementing the Real ID Act here on Guam. Is that being implemented currently in the CNMI, if I may pose the question? Thank you for the question. The CNMI uh, does not apply the Real ID regulations to their current driver's license. And that, that raises my concern, Mr. Speaker, because the way the bill is written on page two, line, section two, it reads, a person in his or her immediate possession of a valid operator's license issued by the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands who shows proof of having held a valid driver's license for no less than one year and proof of U.S. citizenship may exchange his or her license for a Guam driver's license. The, the individual shall pay for all fees associated with the issuance and or renewal of a Guam driver's license. That's it. That's the only new mandate. And so my concern is that because this just allows you to basically walk in with your CNMI license and, and you're going to be able to get a Guam a driver's license, there's nothing here that requires the conformity to the Real ID Act. And I'm concerned that passing this and authorizing this process to take place may cause all of, our, all of our Guam residents to have all of their Guam driver's licenses no longer accepted under the real ID provisions because there is a, uh, a propensity for those driver's licenses to not have met the real ID requirements as, uh, as a result of this, this law. My, um, my second concern was whether or not the, um, the measure was vetted through the uh, property and casualty insurance companies here on Guam that insure our vehicles, uh, only because uh, I'm not quite sure how this may affect the underwriting requirements for their insurers, if they're going to be author authorizing a um, reciprocity agreement um, for somebody who's going to be able to get a Guam driver's license without necessarily having gone through the same um, requirements to obtain that license. Um, so on those, two, on those two areas, Mr. Speaker, but predominantly on the Real ID section, um, until I can get some kind of something in writing, some kind of affirmation that this act will not undermine the Real ID um, implementation, then I can, I, can, I can probably get a little bit more comfortable. But right now, I mean, with the whole driver's license issues we're having, one of the, one of the biggest reasons why our people are, are suffering through very, very long lines right now and a lot of wait times is because we're getting ourselves into the real ID system. And um, if by virtue of passing this, we may cause all of that to just be tossed out, we would have inconvenienced our people for a very, very long time having transitioned into something that all of a sudden um, was no longer held valid because of the passage of this bill. So um, if I may pose a, a final question to the author, do we have any kind of affirmation, anything in writing from um, Revantax, the uh, driver's license people, or the federal government um, affirming that 
the passage of this will, uh, will not undermine our implementation of the Real ID Act here on Guam. Senator, I thank you for raising the question. Uh, there's nothing in writing at this point in time and working on getting that from the administration. However, I do concede that, uh, and I would be amenable to a proposed amendment just to be abundantly, if not redundantly clear, that applicants for whom this shall apply must comply with the Real ID Act. Although I want to enter for the record that the Real ID Act uh, is a federal requirement. And I, although I'm not an expert, I would assume that no local provision of law can allow the state to bypass that federal requirement. It's, it's actually specified in federal statutes there. So, um, but I, 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 do, I do see the, the point that you raised, uh, Senator Sinicholas, and if it means that we can garner your support and so that it's abundantly clear uh, that everyone, to include residents of Guam and the CNMI, uh, must comply with the Real ID Act, uh, I can concede to that. I appreciate the, the response. Uh, at this juncture, I, I probably would be open to entertaining uh, such an amendment, Mr. Speaker, but again, I, I, I would probably prefer to have, um, have something like that drafted in consultation with the um, implementing agency, just to make sure that the language is exactly what it needs to be in order to um, uh, not cause us to be in violation of any of those provisions. So I'd like to um, perhaps uh, suggest that we, uh, at this time, set aside perhaps Bill 123, uh, until we're able to get um, some kind of clear guidance in writing from the Department of Revenue and Taxation on the specific language that would be acceptable for us to amend into this bill in order to protect our uh, transition into the real ID system, if I may suggest. Senator, Senator Castro, um, can we set this aside until tomorrow and have give you the opportunity to get to Reven Tax and get them something in writing to satisfy? Absolutely. Okay. Why don't we do that? All right. Then um, Bill 123 will be set aside for right now. Give the um, author the opportunity to get the requisite letters from Revenue and Taxation. The next bill would have been Senator Joe Snogastine, but I note he's not here. Senator Nelson, 165. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bill 165 is to act an act to add new subsection 3103B4 and 3115, correct, and 3115 and to amend subsection 3105, all of chapter three, title 27, Guam administrative rules and regulations relative to inclusion of the aircraft rescue and firefighting unit under category two peace officers and the modification or adoption of the peace officer standards and training Commission's physical fitness qualification test. Uh, just, just a little bit history about uh, this bill. Uh, we've been working on it since, uh, since the beginning of the term. Um, when we first came in, I, I uh, asked uh, just about every agency where they were at in their um, meeting the post requirements, which is the physical fitness piece. And the post requirements as of today uh, go back to Air Force standards. And when I spoke with each agency, they said that they're doing well and they were at 90% 90, 90 passing rate. Um, after a little bit more questions, I felt that there was a need to have an informational hearing and bring all the agencies to the table and to discuss this in further detail. When we had the informational hearing, about, 90 uh, about just about every single one of them claimed that they would lose over 50% of the force. Um, and so we've been trying to move um, and collaborate with uh, the Post Commission uh, on something that was attainable in a short period of time. Although they, uh, they have had uh, about three years to prepare for the physical fitness test that will take place this December 2017. Uh, after many meetings with the Post Commission, they voted to adopt the current uh, table and standards that is 
uh, written that is a part of the bill in the appendix. So my colleagues would like to reference that. I think everyone is familiar with this, uh, with this bill. The, we've had a public hearing and, and a good majority of the senators came out. Uh, there were some concerns that were addressed. We addressed those concerns in our bill and in the public hearing. And so uh, I, I ask for your support on this bill. Uh, there was a big uh, question that the public was responding to, um, saying that we do need to start implementing a, a physical fitness standard. And right now we wanted to uh, implement with the agreement on the post commission that uh, we would implement this interim standard until next year, uh, July, that they would come with a full PT plan, physical fitness plan, which is inclusive of each agency's standard and requirement. Because right now, each agency, no matter what you do, if you're a firefighter, if you're a, a policeman, if you're a conservation officer, um, if you are a, a, a youth, youth officer at DYA, you are in compliance with, you're required to pass Air Force standards. And so that was the biggest concern with the post commission. And so we, we look to say, okay, we must still have something attainable, something to show the public that we are still holding the leadership accountable in these agencies to have implemented these tasks. Because this interim standard, if they have been doing what they're supposed to do, if the leaders have been doing what they're supposed to do for the past three years, then these, they should be more than fit to pass this standard in December. And I've gone out and in, in, in between the time of the public hearing and to date, and a lot of the officers um, are saying that they're ready to take the test. Um, a lot of the public safety officers, uh, especially the young ones that have been training, were, you know, shared their, their disappointment because they've been working really hard to meet this requirement. And so, you know, uh, I think that in order to save the jobs of of, um, and also the concerns of public safety, because if we lose over 50% of our force, you know that causes a threat. It causes a threat to, to the public. And so what we wanted to do was put something in place so that we can ensure that public safety is kept whole and that we address this issue, giving the agencies their own uh, giving the agencies the opportunity to implement their own standards in accordance to what their job function is. So if you're a firefighter, uh, Assistant Chief Joey St. Nicholas, at the time he was the chief, he implemented firefighter standards. If you're a police, the, if you're a policeman, the policeman, the police do have a standard already, but now they're going to focus more on, on, on perhaps I think it's um, reshaping the standard that they currently have. If you're a conservation officer, they're, they're also adjusting what they do in accordance with what um, their job function is. And so, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Any um, Senator wish to be heard on the bill? Senator Snickles, then Senator Torres. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think I'm going to um, remember this session in particular as the one where I didn't make a lot of people happy. But I, I rise because I have problems with the bill. And the reason why I have problems with the bill is because it seeks to adjust standards that were set, not arbitrarily, not by adopting some kind of um, standard and forcing it onto a group. This was actually a standard that was adopted in uh, consultation with the group. And part and parcel to the adoption of the standard also came with it a, a pay adjustment for this group. And when you raise standards and you raise compensation, there are those who are going to do everything they can to meet that standard. We have officers, we have peace officers who meet the standard. And the rationale is that, well, because we have so many and it's going to put us at risk, we've got to lower it. And I'm concerned with the precedence that, that sets. Does this mean then that all of our teachers who don't want to meet the recertification standards should just get together and make sure that 
the union organizes 70% of them to not bother getting recertified, and then we're going to have to lower that standard? We have standards for healthcare professionals to be able to maintain their health certifications. If a large number of them don't maintain that certification, are we going to lower that standard? We have standards in our food service industry, public health standards, cleanliness standards, san sanitation standards. If enough restaurants say, you know what, yeah, we're not going to bother following the washing the hands requirement because we just don't want to concern ourselves with that, and we're going to shut down 80% of all of our restaurants because they all don't want to conform, either with that or with something actually more serious. Maybe they don't want to bother installing the necessary range hood that the fire codes require because it's going to cost them thousands of dollars more. If 80% of all of our food service establishments are going to shut down and cripple our tourism economy, are we going to lower that standard? I'm certain that there are individuals who are going to be unhappy with me taking this position. But I guess this is the session where I just got to be the vocal minority and speak about things that I really believe are necessary for us to face head on. If our officers were having a challenge meeting this standard, everybody should have gotten together to help. And the purpose of a standard is to make sure that a basic level of service is able to be provided. When in consultation with this group, they all agreed that this standard was going to be the baseline in order to provide that basic level of service, then that should have been the standard that we set. These kind of um, circumstances are never comfortable for us to face and, and deal with. But, you know, when we had a whole bunch of teachers who could not pass the praxis, they're pounding on doors saying, can you guys do something to lower that standard? Sometimes we just got to say no. And sometimes it's going to make a lot of people mad. And it's going to get everybody kicked into gear. Or we can say yes and begin the path down that slippery slope. You know, one of the phone calls a lot of us get when um, tax refunds finally come out is why did they garnish all of my tax refund? Well, if 80% of taxpayers owe GMH, should we introduce something to try and say that GMH should no longer process the collections through revenue tax? If everybody's being held to a standard, some kind of a standard, especially when you agree to that standard, then everybody should be held to the standard. If we have our students all of a sudden wake up tomorrow and realize that, hey, you know what, if 80% of us stop going to class, we're going to create a crisis in our school system because they're not going to have enough classrooms for us because we're pushing out the uh, graduation rate and they stop showing up to class, are we going to just give everybody A's?
I'll most likely be the uh, only or one of the few who's going to vote no on this bill. But somebody's going to have to say that standards matter. Especially when we collaborate and we establish them together. And you have so much time to meet them. You know, one of the um, one of the things I was just wondering was how close, you know, how close did everybody almost get to it? You know? If we lower it by this much, are we still going to be excluding some? I mean, it's just, it gets messy, Mr. Speaker. So, I wanted to rise and express that because it needs to be put on the record. I will not be voting in favor of this bill. And should it pass, and this group gets a second chance, I hope that they fully understand that not only should they conform to it, but that it comes at a cost. You know, um, when we introduce bills, when we set like timelines and stuff, I mean, those are all standards. And I mean, it's just an example of, of how we just kind of push things off. And if we're really going to make things better, we're all, we're all going to have to at some point own up to it, you know? I value the service of all of these individuals. I really, really do. They know that. And I hope that in communicating this, they can also understand that the gravity of this action and what it represents speaks to a greater problem that we have and it's something that we need to move away from. Especially if we're going to continue to elevate, elevate the expectation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Senator Torres? Any other senator after Senator Torres? Senator Lee? You're recognized, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by acknowledging that I am the first co-sponsor of this bill. I decided to be a co-sponsor of the bill because I wanted to devote the attention needed to address what I believe is a very important matter and one that can set the precedent for many other standards that we set by policy. As we all uh, may be aware, the, post, the, the, the genesis of this bill was Public Law 32-232, which you authored, uh, Mr. Speaker, in December of 2014. And in that legislative findings and intent, the, it was stated on page two that the Ilejes Latour and Guahan finds that there are a number of crimes that impact the safety of our island community, and there should be uniform minimum standards for peace officers on Guam with respect to education, training, and physical fitness. When the issue of the compliance, full compliance with this bill became apparent that of all the, eight, uh, the category one agency officers in the agencies that had been administered the test, and I believe that there were 852 um, total who, who were administered the test, or some of, uh, close to 100 did not actually take the test, but there are 852 people affected with the Guam Airport Police, the Customs and Quarantine, the Fire Department, the Judiciary, and the Guam Police Department. And more than half of them failed the test. So the issue became, what do we do if December 2017 is the drop-dead date for full compliance with this public law, 32-232? What do we do? And it was brought to our attention that half of our peace officers will be out of jobs. So the, the test became, well, what do we do then? Do we 
do we modify the standards so that there's something acceptable? And then different formulas came about. Well, let's just, there are four components. One is the waistline circumference. The other is a run test or walk. The third was push-ups and the fourth was sit-ups. Well, it was offered to the body in public hearings that you've got to get rid of the, the waistline circumference. So that was one thing. Then they thought, well, the mile and a half is too much to ask for anybody. So that was another area that they wanted to compromise. I, want, I don't want to repeat everything that was stated by the, the previous speaker because he, he brought up a lot of points that, that I also wanted to iterate today, but there's no need to repeat. But I do want to bring up this point about the standards. Although I'm the primary, the, the, set, the first co-sponsor of this bill, I was extremely disturbed by the modified standards that were proposed in Appendix A of this. And I discussed that at the public hearing because what we have here, Mr. Speaker, is a situation where the standards were modified to the degree where we are one hair short, one second short of high risk standard. Now how in God's earth do we agree that that is even a standard that anyone should aspire to? when you're one hair off of high risk. That is totally unacceptable, in my opinion. And I had suggested to the body at the first public hearing and at the second public hearing that perhaps we should just get rid of the whole thing, just repeal it. If you're going to make it to, you're going to lower your standards to the point where it doesn't even make sense to have a standard, it's quite laughable at that point, but more so pathetic. Why even have this statute? Just repeal it. Go back to where you started. The discussion then became, well, it's not so much that. It's just that the Air Force standards are not, it's not reasonable. We are not the military. It doesn't apply to our, our duties and our tasks. So it's not reasonable. But in following that, I was told by people in the commission that, in fact, the Air Force standard, Air Force standard which is a, a, a scientifically based standard, is the lowest of all the existing standards out there. So it was deemed by the post commission at, in 2014 that if, if you were to apply a standard that, that had some validity to it, that this was the standard that you apply. So that's my discussion about the standards, but I want to go back to the bill itself. And what concerns me about the bill is I see a lot of traps in this bill. I see there, there, the, the adoption of a modified standard before we require them to come up with a, a new standard that we can replace the Air Force standard with in July of 2018. There's no logic to having an interim, in my opinion. And I would like to offer to the body that the, the whole problem here, the root of this bill is to address a timeline issue. If we don't do something by December 2017, we are going to lose half of our category one peace officers because they would have failed the physical fitness and qualification tests per our public law 32232. So it would seem to me that really the issue is, do we just kick the can down the road a little bit further? Because what we're ultimately trying to, to reconcile is that fitness test that the, the commission on second thought thinks is the more appropriate standard. If, if not the Air Force standard, then this other one that they are going to propose and bring to the body on July 2018. If we were to adopt Appendix A and Appendix B, which I, I hope we have good reason and sensibility to take a closer look at, because this is not, a, this is not an acceptable standard, in, in my opinion. It, 
in the mile and a half distance, the time that you're given to, to walk a mile, or the time that's afforded you and the distance that's afforded you, you can really walk it. it it's just beyond, it's beyond easy. It's, it's almost a given. So what I would offer to the body is let's, and perhaps I need to take a little bit more time, but I think what we need to do is, is not so much adopt an interim standard, but push the, the implementation from what it is currently in the statute to from three years to maybe five years. And that way we don't have anybody risk, at risk of losing their jobs any time before the commission comes back with their recommendations for a modified standard, which is in 2018. So you, you give them time, but what you do is you at least hold them to what is a, a known and proven scientifically sound standard, which is the Air Force standard. We do also want to recognize that you've got nearly half of the, of the officers who have already passed the test, who've me, who are making the test. So, you know, you, you've met at least halfway that mark, or nearly halfway, you've already made the mark. So the problem and the challenge is really how to get that other half to advance to the mark. So I would propose that we consider several amendments through this body where we maintain the gist of the initial public law and just move out the time frame from three years to five years and do not adopt the, the interim standards and also you know, make it so that we can, we can really have the, the, whatever recommendation is made come back to the legislature and not go through the AAA process, um, which is contemplated here. I just think that if we go this route, what we're going to end up with is, is a modified standard, which is why have a standard at this point? If this is your standard, it's really not very reassuring, in, in my opinion. You end up with this modified standard. I'm not a, a, a person who gambles, but I would wager that you're going to end up with this modified standard in July of 2018 because it, it is the easy and most is expedient way out of this situation. And it's the most expedient way out of meeting a fitness standard, which we knew was tied into, as the retiring speaker mentioned, a compensation package. It was part of a qualification. And now we are re reneging on that qualification, which also isn't fair to the rest of the general public. But I would proffer um, amendments to this bill where we strike out references to an Appendix A. We stick with the modified, we stick with the, the Air Force standards as is, and we simply move the implementation date further down the road so that we don't run anyone at risk of losing their jobs until we actually decide on a new standard which is a lot more reasonable than the one that's proposed in Appendix A. And I just want to note that, you know, I, I'm not taking this lightly and I'm trying not to be callous and I've spent an awful lot of time looking at this issue and following it for the past two years. But we also have a responsibility to pass statute that not only is in, in, maintains the spirit of the initial public law, where we really wanted to ensure the safety of the community and the officers, that we as employers don't put our employees in situations that are life-threatening because of their physical conditions and that we understand clearly where everybody ought to stand when they take a badge. It's not so much about you and I as it is about that person. And I, I testified to that at the public hearings that really, you know, we have a responsibility also to our employees to make sure that they are fit for duty when we're going to put them under certain circumstances. And, um, and I don't think that we should compromise that. And the, Standards in Appendix A and B 
are a compromise that I cannot support at all. And, um, and it was a standard that when I signed on to, I had tried to argue against, but um, I just hope we can take that into consideration and actually make those changes. Senator, will you be, are you proposing an, a specific amendment when you say remove Appendix A? I will be, um, Madam Speaker, I, I need, it, it's in several places, so I, I will need some time to proffer those amendments. Um, sh should we take a five-minute recess for the, it would five, can you do it in five minutes if we take a five-minute recess right now? Yes, ma'am. All right, so we'll take a five-minute recess for the amendments.
Elias Latour is back in session, and um, Senator Torres. Madam Speaker, uh, I respectfully request that since the amendment requires changes to most of Section 3 and a portion of Section 5 that um, I just withhold uh, introducing the amendment and allow other speakers in the interest of time to make their presentations. Thank you. All right. We'll allow that. Thank you, Senator um, Torres. Speak. Point of order, uh, Madam Speaker. So are we addressing this amendment or are we acting as the amendment was never proffered and then we will move forward to another speaker? We are going to... If there's no objection, we're going to move forward to another speaker. Oh, no, I object. But I'm, I'm thinking that, are we waiting for her amendment to come out on yes. paper? Yes. Okay, so now we're, I just want to state for the record that I object and I want to explain why. But I, I want to see the amendment on paper thoroughly and then I think that's what we're doing, right? We're moving over to the next speaker. That's correct. Okay. Wait, so are you objecting to moving to the next speaker? No, I'm objecting to the amendment. Oh, okay. Yes. No, we're not there yet. Okay, thank you. Yes. Madam. If so, if there is there any objection to uh, allowing the next speaker to begin, and uh, we'll come back to Senator Torres when the amendment is in writing. If there's no objection, then Speaker Cruz, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wasn't going to speak on this bill, um, but. Uh, when one of the senators w rose and tried to accept the responsibility for not supporting the bill, I really had to rise and, and speak about also my, my concerns for this bill and uh, why I could not support it. As was pointed out by the previous speaker, I was the sponsor of this legislation. Though I was the sponsor, I can assure my colleagues this was not an original thought of my own. I did not write this piece of legislation, the, I mean the, the, the original post bill. It was brought to me by post. It was brought to me by post with all eight agencies in attendance. We conducted several public hearings and at, that, at those public hearings, I went round the table at, to every single one of the directors of each of these agencies and said, you guys, I'm going to get blamed for, Im, for Im, being the sponsor of this legislation and requiring you, your, your men and women to meet these standards. Are you convinced that your men and women are going to be able to meet these standards? Not once, but twice I went around the table and every director assured me, assured me that they had discussed this with their department, they had discussed this amongst themselves, and it was their combined decision to come to me as the oversight chair of public safety at the time to introduce the legislation and push it through. I'd be willing to write legislation for the standards for the bar, but I wasn't going to write legislation for the standards for the police, for peace officers. They wrote it and they brought it to me and I, it, put my name as the, as the oversight chair to introduce it. And so I just want that very clear that this, that the original legislation was not my thought, part of my, as many have referred to me, my nanny legislation. It was not something that I wanted to, to impose on people. It was requested. And I also didn't want to get up and speak, but I had to because it just kept coming up by the speak the 
speakers before me that somehow this December my legislation or the legislation that I introduced was going to be responsible for half the police force being thrown out. And the previous speaker is very modest and humble. Because as I understand it, the one agency that was trying to get this, who understood what this post legislation was and was, was complying with the statute because the statute reads, the, the uh, PFQT policies shall be phased into implementation over a three year period from the effective date of this regu regulation. At the time that it was passed, the judiciary understood that they had three years within which to implement this. And they were going through and getting their men and women ready to take the test. They got them a certified trainer to train the men and women to make sure that each one of them had a, their own program within which to comply. And to lead by example, the Chief Justice himself was going through the training. Not only was the Chief Justice going through it, but at the risk of embarrassing the previous speaker, she was also going through it. And she was passing. She was doing everything that, was, that everybody else was going to be required to do. And I do wish everybody would please go back to the original legislation, 32-232. Nobody is being thrown out on their ear this December. The initial three-year period does run out this year, this December. Yes, that's true. But after this implementation period of three years, starting December, they will and I'll read it so that people don't... At the end of this period in December, they will take the test. And if anybody fails the test, under the regulations it says, peace officers must retest within 90 days following the unsatisfactory um, PFQ test. Agencies may not mandate peace officers to retest sooner than the end of the 90-day reconditioning period. So starting this December, if they fail this December, they have 90 days within which to retest. They have four unsatisfactory periods. After the first 90 days, a written warning is issued and the peace officer must retest within 90 days. Second unsatisfactory, a second written warning is issued and the peace officer must again retest within another 90 days. A third unsatisfactory, a third written warning is issued and a peace officer must retest within another 90 days. And a fourth, then he gets written up and he's temporarily suspended from his position and moved to an administrative position. But since December 2014, all of these agencies should have been doing what the judiciary was doing. Get a trainer into the department and start getting your people conditioned since 2014. That's why the judiciary, when they came in, they had the highest pass rate. The rest of them were sitting there waiting until now so that they can come in and cry that it's not, they can't pass this test and they're all, there's not going to be police officers in the streets because we can't pass the test. Even after that, they're, they're given abilities to be able to, it's um, agency heads shall initiate or recommend administrative action only after the peace officer has received 
four unsatisfactory scores in a 24-month period and failed to demonstrate a significant improvement despite the reconditioning period that he or she has been provided. When this bill was brought to me, it was brought to me because it was their desire to get their men and women conditioned because it was their concern that their own people, it's not so much that they weren't able to, to perform, but they were concerned about, and rightfully so, they were concerned about the health of their own officers. Police officers were dying, firemen were dying of heart attacks, and it was the post decision, not mine, it was the post decision to come to the legislature to try to provide some incentive to, to get them into shape. So we can do whatever is the desire of the body, but I just wanted to clear a few things up. One, this was not my idea. This was post. Two, I cleared with every single one of them as many times as I possibly could and made them state on the record that they believed that they were going to be able to comply. And three, they've had three years within to which to start the preparation so that a higher number of them could pass this December. And they would have until 2019 within which there would be a cutoff at that point. And uh, there would either be in administrative positions or they would be um, laterally transferred someplace else. That's five years. I just wanted to place that on the record, Madam Speaker, that the, the original law does provide them with sufficient, everybody with sufficient time within which to condition themselves. And I, I know it's not impossible. I know that there was one police officer who on Facebook uh, talked about a 40 pound drop with his ketone diet that he went on. If there's a will, there is a way, and I know that it's possible. There are other members, even members of this legislature, that talked about their 40-pound drop in weight. And so it is possible. And I just wanted to state for the record that the, this panic that people are going to be without police officers and fire firemen because of legislation that I, that I sponsored at their request is going to be respond, is going to cause uh, problems in the community. That, please, I just want that clear. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another speaker on the bill? Senator Munya? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I rise in support of, of this bill, um, not because um, I support reducing the standards. Um, I do, I look back at it and I see that uh, the Air Force standards was implemented uh, in October 2013. And I do understand that there, it, it did give them enough time to, to um, at least come up to at least meet halfway. Um, and I'm looking at the Appendix A and I'm realizing, as some of the previous speakers said, that this is like the bare minimum of uh, physical ability. I, I know a few of the uh, peace officers and, and I think each officer has, has a different, they're, they're all different factors of the reason why they probably um, can't meet even some of the baseline standards. As a, as a certified instructor myself, uh, I've seen all kinds of people uh, come through the gym who 
although have been working out for a long time, uh, you give them a, a different type of activity and it could be almost impossible for them to do. So to say that um, just because you can run, for example, uh, you can get down and do 50 push-ups or 50 sit-ups is, uh, is really unfair. So I do believe that it does take a training period and, and maybe even more just a, a training period, more like a, a lifestyle change for some of these the peace officers. I think some of these peace officers um, may be, I'm just assuming, that the last time that they were really physically active was probably when they joined the force or the agency and then cho chose to become comfortable with life. And I see that all the time. I see that. I mean, I try to motivate people to get to the gym all the time. And a lot of, their, they, a lot of them have excuses, one excuse after another and after another. And maybe since October 2013, that excuse kept happening up until today, and now they say they can't do it. Um, so I think for me, I'm in support of this because if you take a look at the, uh, the, the standards on this particular bill here, you, you can, I mean, we can all look at it and go, oh, that's easy, we can do it. But if you've never tried it before, you can't, don't really know. Um, but I think this is a, a fair base standard for them to complete. And then maybe we can consider a, a different type of standard for our peace officers. Um, as far as um, as far as like waistline circumference, a lot of people don't understand that uh, waistline circumference really can and will determine the condition of their heart, um, which is one of the reasons why um, waistline standards are implemented. But I've also seen some people with a really small waistline with a very terrible heart condition. So. Um, I, some of the officers that did, um, did uh, testify at the public hearing did say, look at my waistline, but I could run a mile, you know. So I think uh, much more than just allowing them to be physically active like this, um, I think uh, other medical procedures should be done before we require them to do this. And, uh, but really... I think for, for my family's sake and the safety of our family and myself, I would like them to at least complete this baseline standard and then more. But it's a matter of motivating them. And I think that really happens uh, starting from the, uh, the supervisor position. So I do support this, um, Mr. Speaker, and, and I thank the author for at least considering that for a lot of these officers, it's much more than a physical change. It's a lifestyle change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Any other senator wish to be heard? Senator Lee. This is Bossy, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I just wanted to make a few comments on the bill as a whole. So I think in general, what we're talking about here, what, what we're talking about in the in original post bill and then this bill 165 as introduced is we're really trying to get the heart of the matter is the safety of our community and the safety of our officers. So we want to make sure that not only is the individual officer as fit to serve as possible, but that that person is also ready and capable and willing to assist their fellow officers as they're on the job so everybody can come home to their families and so that they can continue to keep our community safe. So I really commend the Post Commission for trying to attempt to address this issue. And I, and I agree with what many of my colleagues have, have said, that we should not just meet this standard, but we should really exceed these standards. And I appreciate the chronology that you outlined as you were speaking, and I share a lot of the concerns that were raised by my colleagues. I attended all of the hearings, all the public hearings, and I heard the testimony from many of the individuals in our community who came out um, in support of these measures. And I just wanted to maybe pose a question to the author. Are we addressing this bill as introduced, or is there an amended version? Are 
Are we addressing this bill as introduced or is there an amended version? No, what you have is, is what we uh, submitted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one of the questions that I had is, will the doomsday scenario that everybody has outlined actually happen? Will we lose half of our public safety force? Is section one, the legislative findings of intent, I, I think that when it was written, when the bill was introduced, these facts were correct, but as it stands today, I think that these numbers have, have changed, maybe even significantly in some cases. Um, during the public hearing, it was noted that only the Guam Police Department and the Guam Fire Department were noticed in the legislative intents and findings for their high failure rate, but 11 other agencies and, and three other categories are missing from this. And so the chairwoman, um, if, I, if I can recall, had mentioned that you know this was the information that she received and so that's what they placed into the legislative findings and intent and so there are a number of suggestions that were made during the public hearing um, the chairperson Mr. Santos Tomas supported adding um, aircraft rescue and fire as well as the Department of Youth Affairs which I don't see added onto the bill uh, point, of in point of information Mr. Speaker uh, the Department of Youth Affairs is, is, uh, t is already originally there. The concern with Department of Youth Affairs is that they're not a voting member of the Post Commission. And uh, to address the, the uh, legislative findings, if, if the previous speaker would like to make adjustments into the legislative findings, we do have those numbers now today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There was also another um, concern that was raised on page six of the bill with regard to the date. So it was um, on line two, it continues. So adopted by the Guam legislature in the form of a resolution or bill by December 2018. So they were requesting to include an actual date. So maybe December 31st, 2018 or December 1st. Um, and there were a number of recommendations that were raised during the public hearing. But I, I do just feel like there were a number of concerns that were raised. There were a number of concerns with regard to incorporating a standard that included a wellness expert and fitness coordinators to assist these agencies in um, achieving these standards. But again, just in general, I think we need to keep our eye on the ball here and make sure that given the timeline that you had, that you had described, the chronology that you had described, that there was more than enough time to meet these standards and that that's something that we all need to really consider as we move forward and in taking a look at this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator Lee. Um, any other senator wish to be heard? Senator Torres, Tor oh, Senator Espaldon. Oh, it's, Senator Torres, do I understand your, res your uh, amendment is prepared and we can ad address it? Has everybody gotten a copy of Senator um, Torres' amendment? Okay. Senator Torres, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I passed out an amendment uh, that addresses my concerns with regard to doing away with Appendix A and B and sticking with the Air Force standards as the Air Force standards as the standards as written in, in the current law and moving the, the date from what was initially over a three-year period to now over a five-year period. So the, the three-year period was contemplated to end on December 2017, but by adding an additional two years, the five-year period uh, now becomes December 2020. And the idea here is to add, to provide adequate time 
for the Commission to come back in July 1st, 2018 for the proposed changes to be considered and adopted and um, have the agencies, you know, in a position to implement the new standards. So that was what was contemplated by giving them a two-year period addition, understanding that they can, you know, maintain the line right now with the way the law is contemplated. But at that time in 2018, July, when they come to us for changes to the standard, then there's adequate time to actually have it play out. So the amendment... Um, I don't know, Mr. Speaker, if you desire that I read it, it's quite lengthy, or if we just reference it, it's on page two, beginning at line 17, it's rewritten, and that would be section three. And then the second part would be on section five, beginning on line five. I mean, on page five, line one, and that would be F, the first part of subsection F. But I believe, Mr. Speaker, that this might be a good compromise to the concerns we have with regard to the standards. All right. On the uh, Torres Amendment, anyone wish to send a Nelson? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I object to this amendment. Um, I just want to point out some things. I, I'd like to thank the previous speaker for offering an amendment. Um, it's always good to know that when people have something to say of substance, they actually know what it is that they're concerned with instead of poking holes in something. However, um, I want to address that this is not a doomsday where people are going to lose their job immediately if they should fail the current standard as prescribed in the public law. This is an issue where we have come to the table time and again listening to the agencies saying, we realize that we made a mistake. We realize that to hold Every single agency that provides public safety was a mistake to hold them to the same standard, which was the Air Force standard. Now, in, I, I'm, I'm grateful for my colleagues for, for uh, attending the public hearings and being very engaged. I really appreciate that. But I, there's one thing you have to understand, that there was a shortage of perspective when this, by the agencies, by the, when this law was put in place and they asked you for this. And I know, Mr. Speaker, you, you even said in the public hearing, you asked them time again, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure? And all of them gave you north and south. We are sure. And then now, at the 11th hour, we come here and we try to find a solution because now they realize that the Air Force standard does not fit the mold to which their agency's job description requires. And so the Army has their own standard. The Air Force has their own standard. The Marines have their own standard. And the, what the agencies are asking, which is prescribed in this bill, that they have their own standard. Now, to, to which addresses that? The next, next item is to address the extension of two years and still give them the AFI standard. In the military, we have three phases, crawl, walk, and run. Crawl, walk, and run. They took this standard when they came before the legislature and they had the mentality that they could run with it right away. Come the third year, we're still looking at them and they're in their crawl phase. And so this interim standard, which I remind you, was voted on and adopted by the Post Commission, is a temporary standard so that they can have the time to develop their own original PT standard per agency as their job description requires them to do. This also addresses some matters. They do have a wellness coordinator or wellness instructor in some other agencies. But the big question is, is have they been implementing it? Have they been using it? And the answer is no. The leadership has failed to look at the implementation process to help 
those other officers that may be suffering with heart, heart, um, heart disease, high blood sugar, obesity. And so this implementation, this crawl, walk, run implementation is still holding them accountable come December 2017, telling them that you need to address these issues and incorporate it, as we discussed in the post commission, incorporate a wellness plan by a physician, which they have not done. I don't know, perhaps they didn't know how to implement this AFI standard. Perhaps they just gave them the standard and said, this is required of you in December 2017. Here, you, you need to pass it, do whatever you need to do. But no, with much discussion and much debate, the post commission and the agencies that represent the post commission see that there, these, these are the underlying issues that they need to address, which is also the wellness of their officer. And so this is really, um, it helped them to open up their eyes a little bit and see, have a bigger perspective that we're not just looking at you to pass a test because if you don't pass a test, you can't do your job. No, it's quite the contrary. It goes much deeper than that. And you know, also, if you don't pass a test, you can't protect the, the public. No, this addresses the wholeness of the officer. Can they perform? Are they safe? Are they well? Do they have injuries that they received on the, the job that, that, they never, um, that they would never sought medical attention for? And a lot of those times, the answer is yes, they never sought medical attention for the injuries they received on the job. And I don't know why the leadership, you know, perhaps we forget the, the wellness piece. We're so caught up in our everyday lives that as leaders, perhaps we forget the wellness piece. But it's a very fundamental piece, especially when it comes to commanding 50 or more soldiers. Wellness piece is a very fundamental piece if you want them to f perform 100% at their job. And this, this requirement and, and created a lot of discussion to open the, open the eyes of these public safety leaders, the chiefs, most importantly, reminding them that you need to look at the wholeness of the officer. It's not about arguing whether you can perform your job whether you, because you, you, can, you cannot run 1.5 miles in 10 minutes, which is the original AFI standard for, for some age group. They're failing to look at the wholeness of the officer. And this bill is looking at that and saying, okay, Let's start something out where we can take it in the crawl, walk, run phase and give each agency an opportunity to implement their PT plan instead of blanketing everyone to perform that plan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the Taurus Amendment, any senator wish to be heard? Senator St. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> uh, as I speak on the amendment, I first wanted to point out a, uh, uh, make an amendment to the amendment on uh, subsection B. We refer to the peace officers as a peach officer. If we can um, amend it back to peace. For the record, I believe that the uh, author of the amendment was probably drafting this um, uh, with consultation from her uh, significant other who's also would have complied as a peace officer under this act. <clears throat> In all seriousness, Mr. Speaker, um, I do have some concerns with the amendment, particularly with that section B, um, because the way it reads is it reads, no peace officers may have their certification revoked or, pla or placed on probation or other adverse action on the basis of their physical fitness until after the end of the fifth year. At the end of the fifth year, <clears throat> the 
PFQT will be administered. That's the physical fitness qualification test will be administered and the results will be used by the executive director to determine whether a peace officer certification should be maintained, denied, suspended, or revoked. And the way I'm reading that is it sounds very subjective. The way I'm reading that, it sounds like after the fifth year, you take the test, and depending on what the results come in, that executive director can just subjectively decide if you should have your certification maintained, taken away, suspended, I guess denied and revoked would probably be used in the same context in that section. And so uh, I guess to, um, I wanted to pose a question to the author, is that, is that the intent? Because for me, that's how I interpret it. It sounds like there isn't any definitive result from the failure of the qualification test. It's basically up to the executive director. If I may yield, Mr. Speaker, I was just reverting back to the language of the original bill um, where the only thing that I changed was the reference to three years. I made it five years and I deleted the um, insertion made in, in the bill uh, where it referenced a method of, of the AAA uh, process in, in achieving the PFQT standards. So this language is almost mirrors what the original bill, public law, uh, currently has. So there was no intent separate and apart for what, what was already established in the public law. The reason why I inquire, Mr. Speaker, is because in the original public law, the reason why this triggered after the third year was because then after the third year, you would have all those different timelines kick in before you basically fell into the fifth and final year which is covered on page five, line one on the second, on the second amendment there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm basically wondering how do those two reconcile? Um, if after the fifth year <clears throat> you would have been deemed to have failed but then also in this language, after the fifth year, the executive director may determine whether you're, you're maintained, denied, suspended, or revoked. Do they not coincide? Without any real authority, what I understand based on the the simple read of it and, and also the testimony is that the disposition of an officer based on his fitness and the PFQT also, the qualification test is not merely purely physical, it, in, it involves education and training, there are other components to it. But I believe that the, the discretion is at the executive di director to find the most suitable um, task for the person. So it could be, it could be as severe as a, a uh, letting go or it could be because of unsuitability to, to fulfill their duties or it could be a placement to another job say taken off the street a, a patrol for example to uh, an administrative position but I don't I don't I can't speak with authority on that because I, I'm simply tweaking what I believe is a timeline from three years to five years I apologize, Mr. Speaker. I'm just having um, a somewhat challenging time trying to follow the amendment with respect to the actual bill because um, I'm not quite sure what is new language that's being proposed in the amendment versus existing language in the bill. Normally, we would have the, um, the original language and the strikethroughs and then the underlines. Uh, and so, like, for example, on the second part of the amendment, page five, line one, it starts at the word failure and then it ends at the word standard with three periods and a, and a quotation mark. I'm not quite sure exactly how that fits into page five, line one, the existing language here. So if I could, um, 
request that the amendment be a little bit more uh, clear as to exactly how it's fitting into the existing language because it's causing me to have a difficult time in trying to uh, follow what the proposed timelines are in the amendment. I understand, Mr. Speaker. What, what we did was on, if you reference line, page five, line six, um, that's where standard leaves off and then the following lines, the remainder of line six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 would remain. That was what was contemplated here. And in the interest of time, I did it that way, and I apologize if it was um, not convenient for the body. But it, it's understood that what was changed was essentially lines one, two, six, a portion of six, and that the rest remains as is unchanged. Um, Mr. Speaker, may we request a, a recess for right now just so we can uh, figure out what is the best way to present the amendment so that everybody can understand? Because I do, I do commiserate with the... Uh, yes, and, and the clerk is, is willing to help. All right, we'll take a short recess. Thank you.